check one, two. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I did my introduction, but uh, I'm Wesley Workman. Um, I've been active in Ember for a while, um, on and off um, in the community, but I've been using it for several years. Um, I work at a startup called Battery, uh, and we've been using it for about a year in our uh, production app. Um, and so I wanted to kind of uh, talk about some general philosophies of Ember and um, use that kind of as a backdrop to, to show how an app scales. Um, one of the sort of pet peeves I have a little bit um, with frameworks like Ember, um, and also kind of with Angular a little bit, is uh, you never really see a lot of really big apps. Um, you always see the to do app or the mail app or whatever, but it's really hard to know what the app looks like when it scales up real big. Um, and that's kind of something you always feel like you're guessing at, or at least I, that's kind of how I always feel. Um, so I kind of wanted to use the app that I've been working on uh, as a backdrop to show this is what you, know, you can build with Ember. Um, I really also wasn't sure about um, the skill set of the crowd uh, since it was the first one. So I kind of thought that I would try something that was just a basic overview uh, and then showing the app and hopefully I feel free to ask questions, feel free to interrupt, um, have more of an informal kind of conversation. Um, so I'll give you just a quick background on battery just so you know what you're looking at. Um, the elevator pitch is this kind of online brainstorming sense making type app. Um, it's similar to kind of an enterprisey kind of Pinterest a little bit um, or kind of a spigot or a bright idea. I'm sure most of you probably have no idea what any of that is. Um, that's okay. I, I still don't um, and I've been doing this for a year. Um, but the target market for something like this is someone who uh, does a lot of uh, branding. Branding companies are a big one. Um, agencies that do a lot of um, sense making work and try to target different uh, consumers um, use certain types of the creative process. And the goal of the app is really to kind of map what a lot of people do in real life um, into an app uh, to help them you know, uh, develop ads and things like that and products. Um, so in terms of our tech stack, um, we use Google App Engine. Um, we have a RESTful API. Um, we use Ember 1.0 um, RC7. I haven't had a chance to upgrade to Ember uh, 1.0 release yet. Um, we use a slightly older version of Ember Data. Um, we use Handlebars, uh, and we also use PubNub. Uh, we use a couple other services, but PubNub is kind of an interesting one uh, that I wanted to talk about because it um, helps the MVC argument a little bit. Um, so why do we use Ember in our app? Um, the code scaling is a really big deal. Um, when your app really, really grows, um, I don't know how you measure the size of an app. I don't know if it's lines of code or complexity or what. Um, but at a certain point, you really need strong conventions and strong patterns to help developers stay on the same page and so that you know, developer A is working in the code base with B knows how to find things. Um, and so that was a really big turn on for us. Um, the top-down routing um, is a general philosophy that Chris kind of hit on. And that's sort of, I'm going to show examples of that and talk about that a little bit. But <coughs> the general philosophy is that, um, like you said, you build your app um, as resources. And you think of your app um, as how someone might deep link to it, um, how someone might come to it from the outside. And um, there are different parts of every app that are reusable um, that often fit into certain resource type patterns. And I'm going to show some more of that. Um, but also, the strong MVC was a big advantage too. Um, two way bindings, um, things that really kind of save you a lot of energy um, and time, and just general MVC pattern in general. Um, so I'm going to jump into battery and then jump back to some slides and then jump back into battery. Uh, I just want to show some different kinds of examples. So in the app, um, we have these things that we call communities, and those are basically like organizations um, you would think of in most apps, um, and different organizations for different types of customers. Um, we have these things called challenges or projects, and those are like the first uh, security model container. They might be equivalent to a repository on GitHub or something like that, just a place where a group of people put their content. Um, and to answer one of your questions earlier um, that uh, Chris hit on a little bit but didn't really um, hit directly is that with the router, um, you see I, I deep linked into this page, which is down in the navigation a little bit. I have a couple of different resources here. Um, the nice thing about the router is it uses promises or futures um, to resolve models, to resolve asynchronous operations, and it does that actually synchronously. So the first thing the router does when the app comes to life is it loads this first community here in my um, URL bar. Can everyone see that? Should I try to zoom in a little bit? You good in the back? Yeah? OK, cool. So the first thing uh, that it'll do is um, it'll try to load community uh, 9001, which is the ID. And it will wait until that community has been loaded uh, before it proceeds. Once that uh, future, that promise, is what they call an Ember, um, has been fulfilled, then it will continue the route down to the next model. And so then it will try to load this challenge with this idea. And the reason it does that along the way is that um, it prevents you from getting into situations where maybe you've accessed something that 
doesn't exist. Maybe that community doesn't exist. Maybe I don't have access to it. And so it gives you an opportunity at each phase to sort of handle errors, to handle redirects, to handle different kinds of scenarios um, that could come about from error states. So that prevents you from really loading your data out of order. Um, so in this case here, um, I'm going to switch through some navigation items. So this guy here on, my, on the side, this is um, one of our resources. And this guy here is in an outlet. So he's in a different kind of resource. Um, and you notice that my navigation kind of stays fixed as I navigate through. Um, this guy has got a model of you, a controller, and a resource. Um, and these guys over here on the side of the pane have models, views, controllers, and resources. Um, and the nice thing about that is as I navigate through um, the different models, um, whether it's a list or whether I go into a specific item, um, the router automatically knows how to check those models and how to insert those in my controllers for me. Um, so it's really kind of the glue that holds that whole operation together. Um, so in terms of the app, um, the app is just basically a place where you can collect um, a lot of different things. Um, there are a couple of different tabs here. We've got research. Um, we've got these things we call insights, consumer insights. Um, we've got these things called ideas. Um, and they sort of funnel down the ideas that you start by doing, you research a problem, and you start to whittle that down into different steps. And so um, that's sort of the basis of the app. So let me hop back over. OK, so yeah, so the, the first point that I really wanted to make was the nesting resources. Um, and I think it's a really big point um, to make because that's really kind of how you think of your app. Um, you start by building your resource. You start by saying, OK, I need a project. I need ideas inside of a project. I might need comments inside of an idea. And that's sort of the mental model that you approach it with. And then when you're building these resources, you start by building, you know, what is my, um, what is my community layout look like? And in this app here, the community layout is everything with the exception of the header and the footer. Um, so if I navigate to the general home screen, you'll see that that column went away. And um, now I have a new page. And that sort of mimics the route up here. And so I'm kind of harping on this because it's really important, I think, to really get the fact that um, the resources themselves, which are nestable, are strongly tied to the location of the app, and they're strongly tied to how you navigate through. Um, and they're also strongly tied to your models. So let me uh, hit the back button. Go back a couple of points. Um, tab over. Yeah, talked about that. Um, event bubbling. So one of the great things about uh, the router itself is it has an event bubbling paradigm from your nested resources, um, which kind of gives you a really solid separation between your app, um, between individual component code, and um, your overarching architecture. Um, the router itself is capable of handling events in a very event-driven way. Um, you can have a widget or a controller or a sub-resource that can emit event, an event that's bound for someone that he may not be aware of. And it could even be bound for something that's kind of contextual. So a really good example of that is when we're on this page here, we want to show, uh, you click, you get a modal. And you notice that modal is routable. So as I change, the route changes at the top. Um, in order to open that, we send an event. And there is a receiver, which is on our list guy, our list resource, which is this and over, that knows, hey, I need to change the route. And I'm going to show this dialog. Um, and then when you leave that resource, he changes it back. Um, but the great thing about that event is that it's handled differently when I'm, say, on the summary page. On the summary page, we don't actually want to change the route. And this is just a very specific thing of our app, but we don't change the route. But if I were to click something over here, let's see. I think I have some idea. Yeah, so I have this modal. So it seems like it does the same thing. But um, it doesn't actually change the route. And so the point with that is that this component, whether it's the event guy over here or whether it's a research widget over here, um, can send the same event with the same piece of context that can be handled differently depending upon where you are in the app and depending upon what resources might be there to handle it. Um, let's see, there was another point that I wanted to make before I moved on. Oh. Um, Another thing that is sort of really nice about that nested resource is that in this particular case here, this modal is a, a third resource that's nested below this, which is nested below this whole thing. And um, in Ember, there's a declaration you can make on your controllers called needs. 
And the idea is that you can tell um, one resource or one controller that he wants to consume information from another one. Um, in this case here, I've got just a basic navigator, similar to Facebook, you know, you're navigating through your um, pictures, so you don't want to close the modal each time. And what's actually happening here is that the controller for this modal and this particular resource knows how to talk to this guy in the background, and he can page through. And that's done automatically through dependency injection. All I have to do is um, make one declaration that says, this controller wants access to this controller when he's created, and it injects it, and it just works um, as a list. So that's a really cool feature. Um, so that's kind of how all the resource thing really ties together. Um, and that's why it's kind of important to think of things, I think anyways, not necessarily in terms of models of using controllers, but general overarching resources and the needs of those particular resources. Um, talked about the router async. Uh, one other nice thing um, about the router, and this is kind of a specific tidbit, is that um, the whole thing itself, as it's transitioning from route to route, is all asynchronous, whether it needs to wait on the server, um, or you can have it wait on a user action. And a really nice, excuse me, example of that is, you know, if I start to edit something and I decide I want to navigate away, um, I can halt the transition, or I can make it an asynchronous one, uh, and I can choose to prompt the user if they wanted to navigate away or not. And the nice thing about the resource is that just works. It works everywhere, and it's very little effort. Anywhere I am in the app, um, as long as the resource knows how to check if there's uh, unstale information, I can just automatically get those. What's up? Um, yes, there's there's an event on that um, guy that gives you the transition before he actually starts. Yes, and so that will bubble up first. So each resource at each level gets an opportunity to stop the transition if there's stale information. So, for example, if I had inline editing in this. I might transition out of this resource, and as I start to transition out of this resource, I can cancel that to prompt the user to save any unsaved information. Um, so that's really kind of all I had. Um, big crowd. <laughs> um, I, one other thing that I thought was worth mentioning um, simply was uh, we use PubNub in our app. And um, some of the big value of MVC simply is that uh, everything has got two-way bindings all the way through. Um, like I can upload something from my phone into our app. Let me see, upload a photo. As soon as that uploads. OK, so you get a nice red dot here. Our count's now updated from a stats event. Um, Sorry, did that come in from a socket? From mobile. So we use PubNub okay. um, on the front and the back. So what we do is um, when the back end has an event, it'll emit it through PubNub. Um, and then our Ember data layer will listen for certain types of events for certain models. Um, that are loaded in the client, and it will populate um, delta information on those. So in this case, the view here is bound up uh, to the model's delta property, or what we call the delta property, indicating that there's a change. Um, and that automatically bubbles up, and that will do it anywhere you are in the app. Um, lots and lots of different views will, will do that thing. So it's kind of nice that when you're using those two-way bindings, just it all just magically works. So it's not that the resource or the app has to be aware. If you update the model, the view updates. So that was just kind of a point of the strong MVC nature of um, Ember. So any questions? I know I kind of hammered through a lot. And I know that this stuff might uh, be more intended for a sort of an intermediate audience that does have some experience with Ember. But um, sure. So I noticed that when some of those things are loading, I just thought of this now, you know, you're fading in when you get the content. And I was just thinking, if you're not using a lot of views, I mean, are you using any plugins like Animated Outlet, or is that? you know what kind of technique you're using there? Do yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there is Animated Outlet, which is um, uh, a really good framework that someone wrote, or a really good extension um, for animating outlet fades. We're not actually using that. Um, what we do is we have a, uh, we use Isotope, which is the Mason Review here, 
um, that you see. It's a sort of the Pinteresty kind of view. Um, isotope um, will reposition things for us in the DOM. So when we insert things in the DOM the first time, everything is display none. Um, isotope comes alive, rearranges things, calls our hook, and then we change the, the display with the CSS class that animates it in. Yeah, so you got something like did, what is it? Did insert element. Did insert element. After that, you yep, so did insert. That yep. Isotope. Okay. Yep, so the entire resource um, view here, the entire list view has um, a isotope handler on him. So whenever the content changes um, or whenever he comes in and out of view, um, he'll insert the stuff into the DOM first. Isotope will rearrange and lay it out, excuse me. And then we'll change the display, uh, which causes the fade. So I think I can make that happen again. Well, that's all the items I have. Let's refresh. It has infinite scrolling, but I didn't really fill this challenge up with a lot of stuff. Oh, it didn't fade. Of course. Yeah, yeah I think that it's only a fade on a page. OK, sorry. I think it faded on the home page. Yeah. What's up, Chris? Do you have the Ember Inspector? Yeah, absolutely. Can you maybe bring it up and poke on some things in the page and show? Yeah, sure. Like what's happening there? Sure, I would love to. Um, so let me uh, rearrange one thing real quick. We have a rogue view that causes the inspector to throw a fit, so I had to rearrange that. Okay. Um, so this is actually a pretty good page um, to show. So this whole thing. And it gets bumped a little bit because of the margins on our page. Um, but this whole thing, the entire page is the application resource. That's kind of, if you're familiar with like state charts or graphs, that's your root element. It's always there. And you really don't ever navigate to it. You have to navigate to things below that. Um, so then we have a header, which again, weird margins, um, is the entire thing that spans the page. Um, the header element um, is one outlet at the community resource level. And then we have the community, um, which is our base resource. And then we have a footer. Um, and the nice thing also uh, that the mail app didn't really show is that you can have multiple resources per page so that when I log out of this app, the, the header resource and the footer resource both change so that my name is no longer there. Um, so at each different tier, you can have several different resources. Look in real quick. Let me go, I'm going to go back to a more interesting page for the Ember Inspector. OK. Uh, Got to rearrange that view. Sorry. The uh, Ember Inspector assumes that the first Ember view in the DOM is the view that it needs to work on. And we have one that comes in first. OK. So again, we have this challenge layout, which is everything that fits inside the footer. Um, and then we have a widget group, which this is another outlet. So this guy, um, you'll notice that when I'm not on this tab, this outlet's not visible. There's nothing in it. It's just a stub. Um, but when I do go to this tab, it inserts um, this extra widget into the outlet. Um, and then I have challenge research, which is everything that's on this side of the control widget. And then I have uh, one more um, sub resource, which is inspiration. And that sub-resource is just simply um, changed out when I have this modal in place. Um, let me poke through some, I can poke through some routes. Oh, routes. Yeah, the app is big. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, this shows you all the routes that are in the app. These are all the places um, in there. And I again, I like to think of them as resources. I know it's kind of like a mental thing that I'm really Trying to drive home. Uh, but so you'll see your bold is actually where we are. And hierarchically speaking, there's a subtle indent. It's a little more apparent, I think, on my screen. Or maybe it's just my perspective. Um, but you can click at any point, and you can inspect um, the element here. I can click over here, and I can inspect uh, the controller. I can look at um, my data store, which is inserted by dependency injection. Um, I can look at um, some targets. I can look at other things. So this is a really great debugging tool that just landed. Um, and it definitely makes life a lot easier. Um, I can also poke through my data store. Uh, I can look at all my entities that have been loaded. Uh, so I remember how to close this. Yeah, so I can see all these different entities that have been loaded. I can inspect the entities. 
I can change them in line. Like, let me see if I can find a file. Um, let's see. So let's blow this up. Let's add a unique tag real quick so we can find it. For some reason, it likes to show the tags. OK, so it's this guy here, probably. OK, so the name is coffee. So if you notice this right here in the background, um, what this is doing is this is actually in my debugger. It's manipulating my model. Um, and my view in the background is simply going to respond to the model change. Um, so in the body, I've got the capture location. I took a picture on the wall. But I could call this um, and I just changed my model. And the view reflects that. And I could actually probably commit that and have it change if I so wanted to. Um, Any more questions, Chris? Uh, how does it handle like memory management and stuff like that? I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at that as a pretty big app there, and I know that that's one of the things that big apps run into. Sure. Is start getting the memory leaks and things like that. Yeah, that's a good question. Absolutely. Um, there is, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's a single page app, so it definitely has a higher memory footprint than most of your apps do. Um, let's open the profile. Um, a couple of the guys on the core team recently spent a good bit of time, um, or what am I looking for, timeline, uh, a good bit of time really improving um, lots and lots of things that are really idiosyncrasies to JavaScript, um, string concatenation, lots of other things to ensure that it doesn't, um, it's not causing lots of uh, garbage collection and things like that. Um, the general memory footprint, I think, is probably going to be around 30 to 40 megs, um, so 35 megs here. Um, as I scroll, that will pick up and collect. Um, so I, I don't think we've, memory footprint has certainly not been a problem that we've run into. Um, it's definitely higher. Um, on mobile, it is a little more sluggish on mobile. There's no, um, there's no denying that. Part of it is that we haven't really tuned our app for mobile too much. Um, but yeah, so I. So you could potentially tune it so that only the stuff that the user is like looking at is, is in memory at that particular time. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one of the great things about the way that resources load also. You can um, load code. Um, conditionally as the user navigates. So you can boot your app with a very little set of code. And as the user is navigating through your app, um, you can load, make decisions about what code you load. You can load different views that are targeted for mobile and things like that to keep that small. Um, that's something that's very easy to do and almost practically baked in at this point. Um, but yeah, the truth is it's a heavy JavaScript app. It does a lot for you. So it's definitely going to chew up some clock cycles. Like, I don't know if you've used Backbone before, but that has a like, no really problems quite often just because you know you're trying to decide when you go between views, am I just hiding something? And you know, as I click around the app memory's growing because you just keep creating views and bodies. I just know from having used JavaScript and, and doing a lot of front end work with it for ten years mm -hmm. that memory leaks always end up yeah. being a problem in big apps. So, so the cool thing in Ember, like what, like you said, when somebody's not looking at something, it tears down, it keeps track of all these views. Yep. So it'll just tear down all the bindings and all the views in between when you're when you're not looking at something, it tears it down. So the memory footprint doesn't actually grow keep growing as you navigate through your app, which is pretty nice. And it also doesn't initialize things until they're absolutely needed. Um, so like in this case, if I refresh this page, um, as it starts, it doesn't actually initialize my views, my controllers, uh, until it goes down into those resources. So the only thing that is really initialized in terms of the main core parts of the app where your code live are this resource, the whole community resource, and then that resource over there. Um, the idealist, which is in this tab, is not yet initialized. It does it on demand. Um, so it is pretty conscious of that. Um, I, I, I won't say as good as it could be, but it's, it's pretty good. Do you ever have any problems uh, updating uh, things like lists and stuff? And, and uh, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with JavaScript objects, you, know, you, you replace one list with another, but that list is still held on to by the thing doing the data binding. And so it doesn't know you added a new list. And, it's looking for changes in the old list. That, that kind of problem ever happened? No, actually, Ember does a lot of that for you, I think. Um, there's not much of that that you really have to think about. Um, 
it's very conventional about how the lists get inserted uh, into array controllers. So if you're looking at a resource that's got a list, it's an array controller. If you're looking at a resource that's got a single object, it's an object controller. And there are a couple of exceptions. But that's the general case. Um, in terms of that, though, uh, when the resource comes alive, you just ask Ember Data to find you these models. It finds them for you. You put them in um, to your controller, or you can have it do it for you. Um, and then you use an each. Um, which is what they used in the mailbox example. And the each um, is responsible for iterating through, setting up each view, associating each view with a particular model. And then as those models are removed from the controller, the each will tear those down. So you really don't have to think about that a whole lot. But, but it handles um, replacing the, the array versus just modifying the array. Yeah, question? absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So the array controller is really just an array proxy. Um, I, that's how I like to think of it. I think it's an easier explanation. So the underlying array. Um, that's set on that array controller is just proxy through the interface. Um, so if you add items or remove items, that interface will emit signals, that array controller. If you replace the array as a whole with a totally different array, it'll emit those signals. Um, so everything just uh, bubbles up. There's a cool demo that answers a lot of those questions called Ember Table. Oh, yeah. Um, it's loading a million rows, and only the rows, it's like, a, like an iOS table view, like only the views on the screen, only the rows on the screen are rendered. Yeah. Everything else is. Yanked as needed, and it does all the cleanup. Everything, so it's pretty cool. Um, can it handle things? Um, and, and so I, I'm going to pull from my knockout background on this one, and maybe some of the two-way binding in Angular. Um, if if you change a property, let's say, right? Yeah, is there a way to track that that property changed and change something else? Um, yeah, absolutely. So there are. It depends upon the certain circumstance. Um, there are observers. Um, they uh, the Ember Core guys would tell you that they're um, they deter you from using those a whole lot of times because uh, you can run into performance problems with the observers constantly firing all the time. Um, there are different techniques depending upon if you're really just interested in mutating some data um, or uh, showing it in a different way. You could use computer properties that are chained. Um, but if you really want to say the user clicks a button, changes a piece of data, you want to maybe do a auto save to the server, um, there are observers to model that kind of thing. Do you know if it does it more the the knockout way or, or the Angular way? Angular kind of like does a loop and checks versus knockout, which just tells you every time something changes immediately, which obviously can be way less performant. It's it's got a run so it's got a run loop so it's definitely um, in response to a change. Um, so the whole thing itself uses uh, a micro framework that they actually wrote called Backburner. Uh, Backburner is a run loop framework for scheduling operations so that. Um, you don't get overrun of constant things. And so one of, one of the aspects of it is that when you have a change, you can fire. Or the underlying metal of Ember does it. You really don't have to worry about that a whole lot. But um, when you have a change, it'll synchronize your change with the binding. Um, and it'll notify anyone who's observing it or any property that might be dependent upon its value changing. And it'll um, do dirty checking like Angular does. Yeah. They use getters and scatters. Getters. OK. okay. Yeah. yeah, that is like the cost is like of not doing that dirty checking is that you've got to use like special gets and sets on your models. So it's not quite as nice looking as like using oh, okay. Angular, which yeah. does dirty checking. Gotcha, OK. Um, yeah, it knows just, like as soon as you say set this thing, trigger all the But The way they're building problems. it, they're going to let you drop in ECMAScript 6 getters and setters that are native, and then you'll be able to switch to the syntax the way that Angular does eventually when browsers support it. Or transpilers. Chris? Computer properties. Computer properties? Uh, OK, sure. Computer properties are easy. Um, I probably even actually overlooked them. Um, let's see if there's any examples here. Computer properties simply is just a. Uh, the, go to the guides real quick. I'm sure there's something in the code books. There's like JS pins and all that. Look, look for moment JS. Like there's probably one that I know we talked about in the forecast. Right there, number four. OK, so that's a computer property. You said you think there's a JS bin here? Oh, there totally is, inline JS bin. OK, great. Um, so a computer property um, is a way of just representing your data in a different way, of mutating your data um, from one stored state into another. Um, in this example here, they're just taking um, a date value. Um, the first thing. Bump it a little bit, maybe. What's the, is it? Uh, plus? plus yeah. All right. Someone would know it. OK. Um, so the first thing they do is that they say that um, this is a property. And it's on the function prototype 
Um, you can opt out of that if you don't like it on the function prototype. Some people do, some people don't. Um, I personally do. Um, but it's on the function prototype, and it's a property. Um, the property takes one value, and that's format. And so uh, it indicates that whenever format changes, um, you should mark this whole property as dirty. Um, and when someone else depends on that property, it'll be refetched and recomputed. And then it's cached until the next time a dependent key changes. Um, so in this case here, it just gets format. Um, this dot get date, it gets the local date. Um, this dot get format, it gets the format. Um, and then it calls moment on the, the date with the format. Um, shoot, just lost my train of thought. Uh, properties can be two, one way or two way. This is a one way example. Um, so in this case, if I were to call set, um, it would never do anything. I mean, it would call it, but it wouldn't make any change. But um, if this was something else other than formatted date, or maybe you wanted to be able to set the date in a formatted format, um, you can call set on the formatted date, and it would call this function, and you could mutate that property. Um, so one way to think of computer properties is data transforms, um, different types of data representation. It's super easy to manipulate those. Um, they're also handy for doing things like counting things in an array. And so like if you wanted to count the number of items in an array that had a certain property, um, you could set up a computer property that counted um, the things in an array. There's a special syntax for that. Um, and provide that as a value. Um, so let's see. Format is LL. All right, someone give me a date format. I hate formats. So LL, so they had this guy at the top. OK, so it's, it's changing below. So this is, this is my date. Um, this is my format, and this is my computed value. So as I, literally, as I type a keystroke, um, it, that fires a binding action, which notifies the format's changed, which causes the moment guy to recompute. Um, so pretty simple. Yeah, super powerful, totally. There are plenty of uh, computer property extensions that come with Ember for doing things like uh, greater than, less than, um, Boolean, not, and, or types of operations. Any more questions? Nope. Awesome. Well, all right. Well, thanks for listening, guys. Um, if, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry <laughs> to interrupt the club. If anyone wants to talk Ember afterwards or if anyone has Ember questions, feel free to like come bug me. I'll be here as long as someone else is here um, until the guys like guys kick us out. Um, I love Ember. And so if you need any help getting off the ground or have general questions, yeah, please feel free to ask. All right. Thank you. <laughs>